We are on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil nations. I would also like to acknowledge that the South Coast region, which is the focus of our stories this evening, is the traditional territory for many other nations who share these lands. It is my greatest honor to introduce to you Sequalia Ann Wanick, who is an elder and knowledge keeper with Squamish Nation. Uh, Sequalia is the elder in residence here at the SFU uh, Indigenous Student Centre, as well as a student of the SFU Aboriginal Business Program. She is a mother and grandmother of three. And um, I am Sequalia, <coughs> aka Ann Wanick from the Squamish Nation. Kayakshtin, I welcome you. That means welcome you to our Coast Salish Territory of Skohotmish Okamayok, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam. And I read your um, booklet and found that this is um, a happy birthday occasion for you, 60. And um, was impressed with what I read in the book that's on the tables. I'd like to share with you that um, Sequalia lived at was my grandfather's grand aunt, and she lived at Hue Hue at Stanley Park, now known as Lumberman's Arch. So I'm named after her. My grandfather was Sequalton Dominic Charlie, and his father was Shinaltzit, and the priest named him Jericho Charlie. And they lived in the area known as Iamo and Sanao. And Iamo is where my great grandfather Shinaltzit lived. And it, when they removed them from the village there, they named it in honor of him, actually, without everyone knowing it, and called it Jericho Beach. So that's named after my great-grandfather because that's where our family home was. And Sanau, just over a bit, was where the rest of our family lived. And the old man, Hotsilano Siam, Chief um, Hotsilano, met Captain Vancouver. And when they removed us with um, incorporation of Vancouver, and they said, they needed to remove the Squamish Reserve there at the planetarium because it was an eyesore on the burgeoning metropolis of Vancouver. And so they removed us and then they named it after that old uncle of ours, but couldn't say Kitsilano, so they anglicized it and it's now Kitsilano. So just as your planners of the land to share with you, and my grandfather was born in about the early 1880s and was a young toddler, young boy, during the fire of Vancouver in 1885 and remembered it. So these are my roots here, and that's why I've always welcomed people to our territory, even when I was about 12 to... 12 and older, I started saying, welcome to our land. And so it's good to see that you all have an idea of being able to do sustainable development and think about the environment and our futures here as human beings. I'm going to share Sequalia's song. And she lost her husband and this song came to her. And my grandfather and other relatives fixed it for sharing at events like this. I'm going to ask you all, as I say, everyone prays to a higher power. The higher power is known by many names. We say Kakakanak Chesiam, Kakakanak, Creator, Chesiam, the High One. When I sing the song, Sequalia Slolum Ha Squile, Sequalia song, greeting of the day, even though it's nighttime. We'll pray for the day we had, beautiful sun. I'm going to ask you all to just 
<sighs> Take a breath. Keep your hands open at your side. You're going to have to uncross your arms. <laughs> because our old people say cacophonics energy comes down in through the top of your head, goes through your body, and then goes around from each of us. You're going to pray for each other because the old people say you don't pray for yourself because everyone else is praying for you. I'm going to also share with you that um, everyone talked about the stones and chakras, and I was like, oh, what's a chakra? And I went to Indigo, found a book on chakras. I'm a speed reader, and read about chakras and went, Wow, that's just like our elders said. The energy comes in through your top and goes through the chakras. Keep your hands open to let the energy flow in the room for this good event and celebration. And pray for all your family and friends from the unborn children, many women having children, the unborn children. The children, the parents, grandparents, now there's a lot of great-grandparents, those in your families who have illnesses or injuries, those battling drugs and alcohol and incarcerated, and those who have lost loved ones. And pray for this event and the people who speak, because we want to be able to have all our energy be positive tonight like the good feelings I felt in the room while I sat and listened to you all talk. So I'm now going to ask you to rise, and I tease people. Keep your hands by your side or open. doesn't matter. But if I see you crossing your hands or doing something, your arms, the old people say, if I'm teasing you, you're all in a good place. When I stop teasing you, look out. And when I, so I tease people and say as I'm singing, if I see that you cross your hands or that, I'm going to step off the stage and come use you as my drum for one beat. <laughs> because I want the energy to be positive like that laugh you just had. For what we're going to learn and hear about and for the work you do important work and um, after I sing the song I'll then um, so I'm going to hit your hands if I see you crossing it and then I'll say a prayer and turn it back over to Robin and Ada ready
Tomi Kaka Kanak Chesiam Yon Sion So Tenoyop and Manman to squalls to seats Yon Sio Manman Squalowen Se Tops Nachem to squalls to seats Asking you, Great Spirit, to bless each and every one of your children gathered here to help them with their mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well being. Help them with the swallowing their feelings in their hearts and spirits, with their states up, the work that they have to do now and into the future, and the legacy they'll leave behind. And for the snecha, the words written and spoken that they'll leave as a legacy for the ones to see what they've done and how they did it. Asking Chen Kwen Mentomi to know up and then Sequero so yo yo kwa swaham shit yon si yon so man man disquals deceits. Asking each and every one of your your ancestors of those gathered here to watch over and guide your families and those who have been here that you watch them and let them know you're walking beside them or with them when they need your support for your well-being. Chen Kwen Mentomi Kakakanak Chesiam, asking you, Great Spirit, to help all of our family from the unborn babies, the children, the parents, great, the grandparents and great-grandparents with their mental, emotional, physical, spiritual well-being saying prayers for all of our friends and family who have serious illnesses, the many cancers, heart problems, other illnesses I can't name, and for their treatments, and those with serious injuries that are going for surgery, for their healing and recovery and therapy, asking prayers for their health and well-being. Prayers, Kwakakonik, for those battling drugs and alcohol and those who are incarcerated because of their addiction and their loved ones who are suffering and hurting for their one that they is addicted, that they feel our prayers and know they're not lost and find that healing path to recovery so that they don't leave us at a young age like many are in this opioid crisis. Asking you, Kakakonik, to help all those who have lost loved ones and are hurting in their hearts and spirit to know their loved one has no more pain and no daily struggles and worries about us who are left here with the, on earth with daily struggles. And know that they look like the happiest time in their life now because they're with all the family on the other side asking prayers for this evening to go really well and for each of the people here chen chen stwite stand and work together to hold each other up that's what chen chen stwite means in choma one heart one mind for the pre looking to the past for the present generations and for the future this is your responsibility that's big on you and Kakakonic help them take care of themselves. Tama Kwetsi Snechum Hoicha. Thank you for having me here tonight. Chen Kwen Mentomi, I'm grateful and thankful to all of you. And look forward to seeing, I'll remember faces. If you ever see me, remind me because I have so many names in my head that it's your face and smile I'll remember. So, Hoicho. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you for the blessing and, and the welcome, and this sets the, a perfect stage for us to continue our gathering here tonight. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ada, and I'm a social planner at the City of Vancouver. And I'm Robin. I'm an environmental planner with Kerwood Lytle. And we're both volunteers in the South Coast chapter, and also your co mcs for tonight. As many of you know, the Planning Institute of British Columbia has been advancing and promoting and supporting professional planners across the province since 1958. And we're so happy that all of you could join us tonight in celebrating its 60th anniversary. 
For tonight's agenda, get ready to hear a series of stories told by community builders and planners who have and are still shaping our, our Metro Vancouver and Sea to Sky regions. So this will be a fast paced event. Um, but unfortunately, we do have a couple of regrets. Um, Darlene Rosari, uh, honorary PIBC member and former Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs and the City of Vancouver Councillor is unable to attend. And also Chief Bryce Williams from Tawasin First Nation is also unable to attend. But we just, to go on, this is a very quick pace and fast pace full of uh, snippets of stories um, that are formed over three eras that we will tell you. Um, and it will be very exciting. So it's our job to keep it on track. Um, there's 60 years to cover in two hours. It sounds impossible. We're going to try our best. So we may, may need to have um, rotating chairs. Right. <laughs> Musical chairs. Um, so we, if you, we, we are going to have really great speakers, so there's going to be great conversations, so I encourage that you continue these conversations over intermission as well as after the program ends. And we just want to um, talk about how we have attempted to squeeze in and showcase a lot of highlights uh, during these past 60 years. We know that our region um, was made in collaboration of men and women of different backgrounds. But unfortunately, with our short program tonight, we only scratched the surface. So we really encourage you, if you see those boards across the room, to please help us fill those gaps. You guys, I know everyone here has some stories that you know of very important moments, planning moments, as well as people um, of the past and present who've done a lot to help bring us to where we are in the region today. And from all this, at the end of the evening, um, PIBC has um, an online timeline that they've been put together since the conference earlier this year. And it will be fed through that and to, to, to kind of uh, make a picture of what the legacy of planning is for our region. And just a couple notes for housekeeping, if uh, those of you who don't know yet, the washrooms, if you just exit out here and walk back towards the elevator, there's going to be on your, your right hand side. And all of you, I know you're enjoying your food, there's also drinks, you can um, purchase some drink tickets at the back, the bar will be open until 9.15 tonight. And also a few words to thank. We have uh, PIBC who helped fund our event, as well as SFU City Program who sponsor our refreshments, and also to Lounge Work who help us with the furniture rental. And also to, to um, Andrea, who's the event coordinator from SFU that helped us coordinate tonight's event. So, Robin, like when I think about planning, there's like oh, all uh, these Ada, wonderful... Ada, I, I think we should leave some time for the storytellers to tell, tell the stories. Well, but I encourage you to put your stories on the storyboards around the room. Well, thanks for doing your job, Robin. Okay, <laughs> so we're going to start the, the first era. Um, the first era is from 1950 to um, 1960. And it's called... Um, let me just get the title. Oh, here it is. It's 1950s and 60s Reconstruction, Regionalism, and Renewal. And this will be led by Ken Cameron, who is a CIP fellow, um, author and former manager of policy and planning for the Greater Vancouver Regional District, now Metro Vancouver. So this is a time, it's quite an exciting time, I think, of uh, basically the end of the Second World War. Uh, the spirit of reconstruction, uh, the spirit of building a new society because British Columbia and Canada started off the war in, as a part of a colony and ended up as a, really as a nation uh, with a whole set of uh, economic and political and cultural changes that took place. We had the beginning of our booming economy in British Columbia. Uh, one person, one wag described Vancouver at that time as a logger's long weekend. Uh, someone else, uh, more charitably, described it as a setting in search of a city. Uh, and I think we can say that through the efforts of PIBC over the past uh, 60 years, we've done a lot to provide the city that goes with that setting. We have the establishment of the School of Community Regional Planning in 1951, the first full-scale planning program in Canada. Uh, and some population numbers, which I think are quite incredible when you look at them now. 
British Columbia had fewer people in it than Metro Van half, well, half the number of people of what Metro Vancouver has today. Uh, and the Vancouver region was half a million people, and it's now about two and a half million. So, been a huge amount of change since then. This was a small town uh, in, the in the 1950s. So, I want to deal with, um, in this, in this uh, era, uh, first of all, the invention of regional planning, and then I'm going to call on uh, Shirley Chan and Mike Harcourt to talk about the freeway controversy, which brings us up to the end of the 1960s. <coughs> This is the map of the Lower Mainland that was drawn by Harlan Bartholomew for the provincial government in 1946. And it's the first map that I've seen that actually recognizes that this is one uh, logical region. This is one piece of a, of a huge and mountainous province that has particular characteristics uh, in terms of its settlement capability, its agricultural capability, its climate, its river, and its floodplain. So, this, I think, was drawn at a time when most people had never seen the earth or the region from the air, and I think it, it, it is an early recognition of the unique kind of region that we have today. Some of the issues related to that were brought to the floor in 1948 with the disastrous uh, Fraser River flood. It remains the largest and most important natural disaster in British Columbia's history, I'm happy to say, uh, because there hasn't been a more important one that's come along, but that doesn't uh, take away from the, the very significant impact of that in terms of damage to property, but also in terms of the impact on the psyche of the people in the region who began to think about uh, the need to plan regionally and to, the, to create the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board. I wish I had a picture of Jim Wilson, who was the first uh, head of the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board, a visionary man. Uh, but this is a list of some of the achievements and some of the things that uh, the, the board produced. Uh, they did the first regional analysis of the cities in this region, not only the region as a whole, uh, but also the individual municipalities. So there was a the beginning of a database for each municipality that could be compared to other municipalities and compared to the situation in the whole region. It, the, in one of the major achievements was uh, the 1966 Lower Mainland Regional Park Plan. Rick Hankin couldn't be here tonight. He is unfortunately in Argentina. Uh, but uh, if he were here, he would certainly uh, verify that that was the basic backbone of the regional park system that we have in this region today, <coughs> set out in 1966. In 1966, also the Lower Mainland Regional Plan, which was the first comprehensive uh, legal regional plan for the region. Uh, and uh, then later on in the 60s, uh, there was further evolution. Uh, the regional districts were established. Initially, there were four in the Lower Mainland and the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board was disbanded and its plan was more or less cut apart and uh, assigned to each of the four regional districts to, to administer. Um, in terms of uh, legacy, I would call this a spiritual legacy, this concept, this sing very simple phrase of cities in a sea of green uh, that resonates right down to today as a basic way of looking at our region, that we will always have a working landscape, that we will always be cities, not suburbs, that we will always have uh, respect for the land in which we find ourselves and we will communities that are unique and distinct from each other but part of a larger region. So that's the spiritual legacy. There were other parts of it as well that uh, I think are, are important uh, to note. Uh, the first floodplain mapping that was done, uh, the establishment of databases, the studies on various aspects as diverse as shorelines to industry to uh, land for recreation, the regional parks plan, a firm land line, which I think we still have today, thanks to the ALR and other things that came along in train, a firm line between the city and the countryside. Uh, the land use designation named rural in the official regional plan became the backbone of the agricultural land reserve and Bob Williams and others will be talking about later on. And finally, if you're wondering where the street numbering system came from that you find in the, in the lower mainland, the numbered, is it numbered av av avenues and I don't know, I never get it straight because I'm a Vancouver boy. But in any case, that was invented by the lower mainland planning board and that is one of the legacies that we have as well. Uh, that we see around us uh, every day. So with that, I'm going to call on Mike Harcourt and Shirley Chan to talk about the freeway controversy. I was trying to save my home, my family home, and I sort of accidentally fell into 
having it also have an impact on the freeway system in the city of Vancouver. Um, we were fighting urban renewal. We felt that what the governments had proposed, the demolition of homes um, at well below market value prices that were being paid by the city and developers for developers, wasn't f fair and it felt completely wrong. And so with my family, we went door to door, knocking on doors, same old organizing style, I think that's used by some political parties, um, to ask our neighbors to support and stand up and fight for the survival of their neighborhood and their homes. And so luckily for us, we ran into Darlene Marzari at a meeting uh, with Morris Egan, who Darlene was a social planner hired to help us relocate. And um, Morris Egan was her boss who didn't fire her for not doing her job, but for helping us. Um, he supported that work. And so she went, she introduced us to Mike and together, I think we were part of a movement in the city because all the routes for the freeway, uh, six proposals, five cut through Chinatown and had the hub at um, Columbia, the Quebec Columbia connector was went through Chinatown. So I'm gonna pause here and ask Mike, because we only have five minutes between us, you know. <laughs> takes me that long to clear my throat usually <clears throat> but thanks Shirley and uh, I want you to imagine what this city would have looked like if the freeway that uh, was planned to come from the North Shore along Stanley Park elevated elevated along our waterfront and then wiping out Gastown and Chinatown and building an eight-lane freeway through Chinatown, Strathcona, Grandview Woodlands and Hastings East and then tearing down all the houses and replacing them with instant disasters called uh, high-rise, low-income housing, public housing. That's what was planned by the city council of the day. <clears throat> and um, put it in context, I had just uh, been called to the bar as a lawyer and uh, storefront lawyer and had long flowing hair. Fu Manchu mustache. Remember those days, Bob? <laughs> and, um, and had been practicing for six months and set up a bunch of uh, uh, free legal advice clinics for low income people and uh, a legal aid society and the, this, the community lawyer program. And I was approached by Shirley and Darlene. <laughs> Very intimidating, the two of them together. And they said, We want you to be our lawyer to deal with the freeway issue. And I said, okay, who are we taking on? They said, oh, well, don't worry about it. I said, no, 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 I need to know who are we taking on? They said, okay, if you need to know, we're taking on the city council, the provincial government, the federal government, the downtown business community, the oil and gas industry, the auto industry, the banking industry, the development industry. Uh, but aside from that, don't worry about it. <laughs> so I didn't. <clears throat> And uh, we decided to take them on with a whole bunch of people across party lines. Uh, Bob Williams on council had been fighting this fight and taking on all the Brits, were the only planners they hired to city council in those days. Uh, and, um, and there was broad support across the city, which was really quite astonishing. And that was really the Rubicon for Vancouver. And we stopped it. And we uh, composed a telegram that Shirley and Darlene took to two of the, um, of the staff for the then Minister of uh, Urban Affairs that said, stop all urban renewal in Canada. And we teamed up with Jane Jacobs and a couple of future mayors in Toronto, uh, the tiny perfect mayor, David Crombie, and uh, John Sewell. <clears throat> and we did. We stopped it. We started the whole different approach to citizen engagement, which we're going to try and bring back to this city, right? I won't get too political, but uh, we've got a long ways to go to restore engaging citizens properly. So that's that's the, the when Vancouver started to become Vancouverism. Yeah, it took six years of fighting. I mean, yeah. it, it went back to council more than once. Um, count, we kept getting new proposals for the freeway. Sometimes it was elevated. There was even a time when it was a tunnel. Um, but whatever, it would have changed our waterfront for sure. I changed our downtown, changed the way our city 
functions today and how we live and breathe. So I think that that six year fight was worth it, but um, it really did take to get the attention of council. It took the federal cabinet minister, Robert Andrus, because Hellyer resigned um, in a a spat with Trudeau, and that was the father. Um, and uh, that his, he appointed an, a new minister of urban affairs, which was Robert Andras. And it was Robert Andras who said, I guess looking at the coffers for urban renewal, um, well, I'm not going to support any program that doesn't have citizen support. The people who are affected the most must support your initiative. And that gave us a place at the table to negotiate a new agreement and a new way of doing business in cities. When we're planning cities, it gave us a place to help negotiate what would go on. We signed an agreement which took months and months to negotiate and we called it, because it was a purple cover, a purple cabbage, right? So, um, but it governed the way we did business with citizens from then on. Um, and the, although more recently we've seen some huge changes. Mike? I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Our second era, 1970 to 1980s, uh, provincial, local, and community activism. Uh, so Michael Geller is a uh, CIP fellow. He's a planner, an architect, a uh, real estate consultant, and a property developer. Uh, he is the president of the uh, Geller Group consulting firm, as well as an adjunct professor here at SFU. But I hear he doesn't often come to class, so I'm not sure if you've seen him around campus. Well, thank you very much. I, I agreed to do this because I think if we're going to plan the future, we need to understand the past. And the irony is that I, here we are talking about what was happening in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and 80s. And I won't ask by a show of hand how many of you weren't even born then. So I think we're very fortunate. I am so thrilled that uh, in my little segment, I've got a number of people who I've uh, known and admired over the years. And uh, the challenge, of course, is asking someone who's used to speaking for five hours to try and do it for five minutes, myself included. But I'm going to try and uh, see what we can do here. So that's not working. There we are. So yes. I arrived here in 1974 as the CMHC architect, junior architect, and, uh, and watched a lot of these people who I'm about to introduce uh, shape our, not only the city, the region, but also the province. So we're going to talk a little bit about creating the ALR. Uh, Bob Williams is going to just tell you uh, basically how he changed everything. One of the things he won't tell you, but I will because I read, when he was elected to council in Vancouver, you could, at the time, he was the first person who was a tenant. You had to be a property owner to be a councillor. Tell that to Gene Swanson. Citizen participation, we're going to talk about the Liberal Region Plan. We're going to talk a little bit how, how, how prescient, we're going to talk about Vancouver's first attempt at a city plan. 30 years before its next attempt at a city plan, and then we're going to finish off with the Whistler story. And since I knew Mike is going to do his thing with Shirley, now why aren't I getting this? Oh, maybe I got to do it that way. No? Um, yeah. turn, turn it the other way around. Ah! <laughs> there, now we're going to do this. So I thought you'd like this. You see, if it wasn't for you, this system would have been finished, Harcourt. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it is important to look and remember the context of today. This is what Vancouver looked like uh, shortly after those. Uh... But I wanted, in my couple of minutes, I wanted to talk about the False Creek story because I think I, I had the opportunity to be the project manager for the federal government. And what most people don't appreciate is when it was proposed, it was hugely controversial. And uh, that's uh, Colleen's father, of course, who was very instrumental in making this happen. Um, Marguerite Ford, who's with us today, uh, she came on to council and uh, was involved with when these decisions came. But the one I really wanted to show you was this one. A city planner resigned because he thought False Creek was no place for families to live. 
So the next time you're telling somebody that you don't think their project's a very good idea, <laughs> remember this. So this is how half the people wanted to be a park, half the people wanted it to be housing, and so the politicians did exactly what we would expect. They made half of it park and half of it housing. I think what is significant, though, is that the South Shore of Falls Creek really did set the stage for so many other waterfront redevelopments around uh, not only Vancouver but the region, and indeed around the world, because it's, it has been emulated. There's just one quick aspect to this development that I think is worth noting, and that is Art Phillips was the mayor, and he wanted public transit serving this development the day the first residents moved in. And BC Transit said, we can't do that. The cost will be too great. And Phillips asked them, how much will, it, will you lose? And based on what they told him, he approached CMHC. Mike will remember this. And he said, I want you to allow us to charge a special supplement to each rental co-op and market unit with that subsidy going to BC Transit until such time as the Falls Creek bus is self-sufficient. And as I look around our region, and I once did a rezoning in uh, Maple Ridge, and I was embarrassed to be involved in a project that was going to be built in a neighborhood that not only had no schools, it had no public transit. I think there's an idea from False Creek that could be applied to many other community developments around the region and the province. So it is now my pleasure to introduce a man who I first met in 1981. I had left the government and joined a private developer to look after the redevelopment of the Steveston waterfront. And the first thing I was told I had to do was go and meet Harold Steves, and he wouldn't meet me in his office, but he said I could come to his home. And I went with my boss, we pulled up in a brown Porsche, and we looked at this farmhouse with the cow shit all over the place and farm implements, and we were both wearing our best navy suits and shiny black shoes, and I turned to my colleague and I said, I don't think this is going to go well. <laughs> and I swear to God, you know how in life there's some people you can't remember the first time you met them. There's other people you can remember the first time as if it was yesterday. And Steve's invited us in, and he was very gracious. And we unrolled our drawings. And I remember showing him all our little plans. And he said, how many units are you proposing? I said, 1,450. And you looked at me, and you said, can't you have more? And I said, are you joking? And you said, no, I'm serious, because if we can get enough people living here, we can bring back the old into urban. <laughs> I've never forgotten that, because the notion that transportation and housing go together. So with that, please allow me to introduce to you a man who's not only shaped Richmond, he's shaped the whole province, and, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his involvement with the creation of the Agricultural Land Reserve. Harold Steves. You have slides? You have slides? Just push yeah. it that way. Okay. Uh, actually, I want to tell you a little bit more about the, the efforts that he did because uh, we're still trying to get high-density housing. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're building a new community center in Steveston. And I'm telling them, you've got to put seniors housing and affordable housing on top of the seniors uh, this community center. We're still fighting that issue today. The other thing that happened was he was involved in the waterfront and we developed the Britannia shipyard. That if you go and visit it today, Michael Geller is the one that designed the first plan. So thank you, Michael. It's been a long time. Okay. Okay. I can't get the one I want. Ah, there we are. I'm going way, way, way back. Some people wonder, where did an idea come from? Well, the idea of the ALR came from in 1944 with my grandpa, my father, my little brother, and me, and we're planning a victory garden. What we did in 1944 and World War II was we planted victory gardens all across Canada and the USA, and we produced 42% of the vegetables for the people on this continent. We've never done anything like that since. Well, the vets came home, and they had to live someplace, and they started living in the farmland in Richmond, and this is the Marpole Bridge, if any of you, well, most of you don't, weren't born then, and we had a problem with the Marpole Bridge because they got cluttered up with people. The vets wanted to live in a little house with a white picket fence, and, uh, and they moved into Richmond, and we had a tremendous traffic jam. A lot of things happened in the 50s. 
The other thing that happened in the 50s, we were told about climate change. Uh, the world's top climatologist told us that in 50 years, 2007, we could sail through the Arctic, and we did. He was the one that won World War II as well by, by timing the raids on Germany when there was raging storms and all the troops were, were getting out of the rain. Well, we had traffic jams on the Marple Bridge. We built the Oak Street Bridge. And you know the old story, build it and they will come. And this is where our problems began. This is what uh, Richmond looked like in 1958 when that bridge was built. The city council one night rezoned half of Richmond, 12,000 acres, didn't even tell the farmers. Uh, my parents found out about it, I think about 1959, my dad went in to get a building from a, for a new barn and they said, sorry, you're zoned residential. And he couldn't uh, build a new dairy in a barn and he went out of business and then they said, uh, now we're raising your taxes and he sold the farm. And that's what it looked like in about 10 years. Uh, our farm is uh, still there a little bit, but down, down to the bottom of the picture. And so that's what sparked the idea of the Agricultural Land Reserve. Uh, myself and a number of others, we got together, we got other students together, and we campaigned to save agriculture. We got involved with the NDP. Uh, we got a little bit perturbed about this. Bob Williams will remember this. So this is the southwestern shores where the, where the uh, ports wanted to put, what, develop port land all along the waterfront. And this is what happened. And this is the big meeting we had. Barrett announced it in my writing when I got the nomination, said we're going to save the farmland, uh, we're going to put housing and industry in the right places, and we're going to save the farms. We brought the legislation in, 2,500 people stormed the steps of the legislature, and Barrett said, I don't give a darn what you say. You can scream and holler all you want, but nothing's going to stop us from saving the farms. And we did. We came up with a plan, and this is Richmond, and uh, we had two reserves. We uh, had a primary reserve and a secondary reserve. The dark area in the center is a primary reserve. We said, that's safe for sure. Down along the river, we put it as a secondary reserve because the port wanted it. We turned it over to the newly formed GVRD, where it's Ken, and they saved it all. We left the decision up to Metro Vancouver to save the whole thing. We had some land uh, uh, a bank uh, a, a part of the, of the application as well. We actually bought and sold and leased about 10,000 acres of farmland to young farmers. That was cancelled about 1978. There was an industrial part of it. We were saving industrial land. That was also cancelled. We revived the land bank just last year in Richmond. This is a, a piece of land in the center of Richmond. We've worked with the FAO and the UN to set up a farm school in central Richmond. This was planned in 1973. We did it last year. And there's the first garden that Kwantlen University planted on that land. So it takes a long time to incubate an idea and bring it forward. But we're still fighting to save the agriculture land reserve and this is what's happening right now. You'll have heard that this last month, the provincial government has put clamp down on the big mansions and said 5,300 square feet is the maximum. Last week, Richmond Council went one further and said, we're bringing it down to 4,300 square feet. So that's what's happening. We're going to have a, a lot of uh, debate on this in the next coming months, but that's where we are today. And my girls say, thank you very much. <laughs> Ken Cameron has written a new book, and it's been, he's kindly donated them so that everybody who's speaking today will get a chance to read a little bit more about the history of this province. It's also a profile, the life of Peter Oberlander. Okay. I thought it was a good picture, Bob. <laughs> there were others that weren't quite so... Uh... So, once I worked for Andre Ouellette, and I remember once going in and giving him a briefing, and he said, Geller... I'm the politician, you're the planner. You give me planning advice, I'll make the political decisions. And I mention that because I think too often, Bob, we're seeing planners who want to be politicians and politicians who want to be planners. But it's appropriate that Bob should come up now because he was both. He started off as a planner. He then became a city councillor in Vancouver. He then went on and was elected the provincial government. And as Gordon Price said, he could talk for five hours just about all the different things that he has done in this province, whether it's in North Vancouver, whether it's in Surrey, all over this, 
all over this region, all over this province. And I must say, I am personally thrilled to see you accept the invitation, Bob, to come here. And uh, after about three and a half minutes, some brave soul's gonna hold up a sign and say, you got two minutes left. Please join me in welcoming the man who shaped this province, Bob Williams. Do you need this? No, Do you you can come up here, You'll, because okay. they're, filming, they're filming you. Oh, I see. <laughs> Well, what a pleasure, and uh, Harold and everybody else uh, to be reminded of uh, all the history, and, and especially to be reminded by Anne that uh, some of us that think we're old timers in this community are reminded who the real old timers are in this territory. So that was a blessing. But uh, I was a boy planner once, and uh, I was the first planner in Delta, and uh, we began to roll back residential zoning in the Delta farmland. And so that became part of my DNA and uh, catching up to Harold and the folks in Richmond. But I wanted to remember a few of the people, the planners, that uh, most, most of you just won't realize that we didn't have uh, all that many planners back then. And uh, as it was suggested by Mike, when I graduated from SCARP with a handful of others, the city hall was run by English planners. In fact, I worked in the, as a draftsman in the engineering department, and I used to go and measure the rainfall on the roof in those days. That was how I started. And the draftsman would say, oh, how are things in the foreign office, Bob, after I'd gone up <laughs> through the planning department on the 10th floor, and they'd pull their hankies out from their uh, seat and, good day, was it? And uh, it, that's where I, decided I'd be a planner. Anyway, on the, on the ALR, uh, we brought in all the planners that had graduated out of SCARP into the government of Dave Barrett. And most people don't realize this was a government of planners to a very great extent. And I just wanted to name some of the names that we had. Norman Pearson, and Norman was with the LMRPV, and uh, William T. Lane was the solicitor in Richmond that was the pioneer of all planning and taught us at SCARP. Mary Rawson was a, an executive director at uh, the Land Commission when we est established it. So there were planners way back then that weren't even qualified by PIBC that were doing great work. The, uh, and I have to remember Jim Wilson, too, who is a marvelous guy. That, and you probably won't know, but the Lower Mainland Regional Planning Board was a, a terrible uh, improper birth. When the government of the coalition, Liberals and Tories, uh, ended, Tom McDonald, a red Tory, said, what do you want in terms of spoils? A chunk of land in the Gulf Islands or Crown land? And he said, I want a regional planning board. So that was the illegitimate birth of the lower mainland planning board, a corrupt game between the liberals and Tories. You won't read that in your history books, folks. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that was great thing, doing the AR. But uh, we also got involved in Whistler, and I wanted to recognize some of the people in Whistler, like Harold Stees, and you'll be hear hearing from other, other critical people later today. But you know, I got a call from Al Rain, who lived there with Nancy, and he said, they're gonna log what, uh, Blackcomb. Can you do something, Bob? And he said, I couldn't believe it. You had a forester at my door after two weeks. You read your letters. And uh, that was the beginning of Whistler. And Dennis O'Gorman, another planner that worked for us, was marvelous and ended up helping create the new town of Whistler. And we, and we saved it from logging. On Surrey, I've always admired Surrey as being next door as a young planner in Delta. And the amazing thing for planners now to think about is we challenged through Alistair Kerrar and other the great planners at the time, sprawl in the Lower Mainland and in Surrey. The truth is, the infilling of the sprawl in Surrey is one of the most exciting urban planning exercises in the Lower Mainland right now. And so working on, on using a Crown Corporation to create a central part of the city, we created uh, so the whole new development. We bought the shopping center, we brought in Bing Tom, and we created the nascent beginning. It won prizes everywhere, and everybody thought it was a joke. Are you doing that in Wally, in a suburban slum? 
you're going to spend that kind of money. The 250 million that we spent in Wally has probably generated about six billion since. It's a marvelous lesson in what a crown corporation could do working with a university and a municipality. It's been very exciting. And now we're really building a second central business district. We are a binodal region. We always have been. It used to be New Westminster. Now it's North Surrey. And now we're looking at the social glue and the cultural glue that can make that thing fly. And I'm glad to say that I've got colleagues from the University of Bologna advising us now and the university about how to create the social glue and have arts and culture being the next step in creating a great university city across the river. So more to do. Thanks very much. When the organizers were trying to discern who should be invited to participate, we realized it would be impossible to talk about the 70s, particularly in this region, without the involvement of Ray Spaxman. And for those of you who were not around in 1973 when Ray became the director of planning, things were done quite differently in those days. I mean, the way it happened was the developer walked into the mayor's office, although sometimes the mayor was the developer, right, Mike? And a deal got done, and, uh, and, then, and it was done. Ray came in and he changed all that with his thoughts about neighborliness, about community involvement, community participation. Now, unfortunately, uh, a small accident has prevented Ray from joining us tonight. But he did prepare his remarks, which he said had timed out perfectly at five minutes. And I'm very pleased that somebody who started working with Ray in 1974 is going to now join us to read his remarks. Marta Farvag is somebody who's known to uh, virtually everyone in the room, a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Planners. You've been on the planning, you chaired the planning commission, you've been on the urban design panel, you've been on the heritage, you're chairing that. And of course, your firm is known locally and internationally for urban design, landscape architecture, and planning, just for the younger people in the room who didn't know you. Marta, thanks for doing this. My pleasure. I am here to channel Ray and read his comments. This is a pleasure. Imagine I'm Ray. One of the most challenging planning tasks is to produce a 20-year plan. We seldom ask to look further than that, since we all know that as time passes, we will be faced with unforeseeable changes. So it can be useful to talk about planning in the 70s and 80s, since we can actually see and assess what was planned during those times, and then subsequently implemented, occupied, and matured. We can now judge its successes, or otherwise, we can also, by comparison, observe the improvements that have occurred since that time in planning and development, and how today's planners have learned from that experience, or not. My role tonight is to describe planning processes that occurred 40 years ago, and suggest to you that some elements from that period might be relevant today, bearing in mind that we are in a time of major technological revolution, a revolution like nothing we have experienced before. The 70s and 80s period was historically significant for the city planning. Many of the principles and the directions that guided growth and development in the city of Vancouver during that time are still relevant today and should not be forgotten. The successes of that period were achieved through cooperation between citizens, professionals, and politicians at all levels, sharing and pursuing some important principles. Those principles were derived from the many individuals involved and especially from the amazingly perceptive advice from numerous experts in the field, such as Christopher Alexander on urban design, Saul Alinsky on public involvement, Sherry Arnstein on community participation, Gordon Cullen on urban design, John Friedman on the role of the planner, Jane Jacobs on planning right, Kevin Lynch on urban design, Ian McCarg on ecology and planning. I list them because the principles they expounded are still relevant. I have for a long time grouped all those principles under one title, good neighborliness. Following those principles in the 70s and 80s, the city of Vancouver achieved some memorable results. 
One especially memorable example is the overall plan for the repatriation of False Creek. In the 60s, False Creek was a 100-acre pool of horribly polluted water surrounded by heavily polluted and polluting industrial wastelands. The plan envisioned a clean recreational body of water surrounded by a necklace of compact residential neighborhoods with schools, community centers, pockets of shopping, restaurants and parklands, public transit, and all linked together on a new continuous waterfront walk and cycleway. The first neighborhood, South Falls Creek, was built in the 70s and 80s became the first fully diversified social and economic community in Canada. It probably is still one of the most successful modern era communities anywhere. Those who know Falls Creek, including the whales that revisited it in the last three years, recognize how special this whole area is to the livability of the city. There are many other examples of successful pursuit of neighborly principles that we do not have time to describe tonight. They include comprehensive sets of urban design guidelines, unique participatory development control processes, the city's first list of heritage buildings, local area planning offices, public hearings held in the neighborhoods affected rather than at City Hall, area plans for Fairview Slopes, Champlain Heights, Yale Town, and so on. I anticipate now that my reader will be getting the your time is running out sign. There it is. So I will end by noting that the 70s and 80s were fun times for planners when much was achieved under principles of good neighborliness, including what has become known as Vancouverism. Thank you. An important part of our planning history, of course, is the metro planning, the regional planning, and the livable region plan of 19, which was prepared in 1976, is a document that I can recommend to everyone because you will be astounded at how accurate many of its predictions were, right down to the, the projections of 300,000 people coming, over 30,000 people coming over 30 years, and so forth. It's a very interesting document. We wanted to feature it, but sadly, so many of the people who were involved with this preparation are no longer with us. But as I looked through the list of people who'd written the document, I said, there's Doug Halverson's name. He'll do it. So we contacted him, and sure enough, Doug came. And for those of you who don't know Doug, he worked at the city of Vancouver. He worked for the Canadian uh, Council on Social Development, he, uh, the, the GVRD, of course. And then he became, got a role which is being repeated over and over again as somebody in charge of community consultation for an energy company. Uh, notwithstanding uh, his, his, his background, he's been active in Chinatown, Dr. Sun Yat Sen Garden, Chinatown Heritage. And uh, I think he's going to come and share just a couple of insights as to what went on in those days in creating that document that has played such a significant role in guiding our future in the subsequent years. Please join me in welcoming Doug Halverson. Boy, th uh, thanks, Michael. You can tell who the marketer is here. Um, I, I was quite shocked to have this call, and, and uh, the people who were really leading this are not available to talk. And uh, that was sobering. But someone the other day reminded me that uh, uh, he'd been to an alumni thing at uh, UBC and he realized that he was to the people in that room what people from the First World War was to us when we were at university. So anyway, I'll do what I can here. You, you cannot talk about this document without uh, talking about Harry Lash. And uh, I just want to point out that this is the livable region. It doesn't say the livable region plan. And that uh, is, is very uh, important uh, because part of what Harry did, and I'll spend a few minutes on it if, if I have the time, um, he was struggling with what is this thing. He had two things that, that uh, concerned him when he came from Montreal uh, to do this piece of work. One of them was involving the citizenry in, in a real authentic way because he had just come through the period uh, with uh, Jane Jacobs and uh, Robert Moses, uh, the freeway in Vancouver. So he, he had done his growing in that period when he'd seen how bad the autocratic kind of top-down planning worked. 
So he wanted to wrestle with the involvement of, of citizens. And he also, um, he, he wanted to try to crack the nut of how complex communities are, how complex everything is, how um, if you make a policy in this area, what impacts will it have there? And, and fortunately, at the time this was done, and unfortunately for some people, because they had nervous breakdowns, uh, computing skill was starting to mount up. And so he did wonderful things allowing the technical side to, um, to, to, to go into territory no one had dared go before in terms of trying to think about uh, the impacts of one policy on another. And then he also got going on citizen participation in a way that I don't think anyone had done before. And I'd suggest no one's done since. And some of that's for good reason. Uh, let me see if I can make this work. Ah. Yeah, I think I'll start with this one, actually. Yeah. So this is a six-sided triangle. And, and I am still confused as to why it had to be a six-sided triangle. It's obviously a three-sided triangle, but what he was trying to get across is each of these groups has to talk to each other. And somehow, Harry, in, in, in the talk that was developed for this plan, that became the six-sided triangle. To, to, to uh, make this work, um, he hired a, uh, a person who'd been at SFU. Uh, I don't know, none of you will remember the uh, 114. Some of you might. The, there was a lot of uh, 60s uh, radicalism happening and some faculty left. Herr, uh, Leonard didn't have to go, but he was one of those fellows who runs out in front of the rifles and said, if you're taking them, you're taking me too. Leonard then, in his new unemployment, took this role to lead this. And I uh, was brought on by Gerard Ferry because um, I'd worked from before, and I joined that group. That's what I had to do. We would go into communities, interfering completely in what would be a municipal topic, driving the local politicians and planners crazy. And the reason was because Harry wanted to build trust in, in citizens throughout the region, and he was choosing types of... Um, types of community organizations that had no resources. And so if we could give them some resources to get to what they were trying to achieve, then they would trust the regional government and participate to help to inform the planners and, and, and help to promote the idea of planning. It was a hard sell. Uh, I've got to move on. This is actually, uh, this is, oh, there's a book, you can get it online. Uh, planning in an Urban Way, Harry's memoir from, from this time. And this is, is, is what he saw as the process of planning. And it's why he, he didn't like to use the word plan, because that suggested something set on a piece of paper. Um, he didn't want to use the word process even, and, and you got to the cover of the book. But he was trying to, in this diagram, I don't know who drew it, whether it was Ted Rashley, you know, who worked with him, or whether it was Harry. But this, this wonderful diagram, which I didn't want to put up till I was nearly finished talking, because I wanted you to listen to me, uh, is, uh, is available in the book, and you can ponder it. It was a wonderful thing. I just, bef before I shut down, I'll d I just want to, I'd, I'd made a list of, of some of the things we talk about now, which you will find well covered in this book. Municipal growth targets, a hairy, or at least a, a GVRD um, invention. Regional town centers, I know my time's up. Housing affordability, and he was down to the very issues we're fighting about now, is doing something in single family zones. Uh, transit oriented transportation, open space, citizen participation. So really, all these things that are such common vocabulary today, it really became common talk among planners in that five years under Harry Lash with the uh, livable region. So just as Spaxman was an important part of the story, 
One of his successors in the role of co-director of planning is an equally important part of the story. And of course, I'm talking about our next speaker. She's highly regarded locally for all the work she did at the city of Vancouver. She's recognized internationally as a planning consultant working in many of the places that uh, I only get to go and visit on my own dime. She was recently honored as the Lambda Alpha International Planner of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anne McAfee. Do you have slides? Yes, yes I do. So it's this one, not that, that one, it's that one. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you can see some of us don't get our pictures updated very often. <laughs> I think this is 20 years ago. <laughs> in any event, I first came to Vancouver in the late 1940s. And during the 50s and 60s, I remember Vancouver being described as an unspectacular city in a spectacular setting. Fast forward 30 years, and Vancouver has become the world's most livable city. And picking up on Doug's comments about the public, the politicians, and the planners, and how we all interacted, I'm going to pick up a couple of highlights from that early period, from 72 to 86, when many of the ideas of what was to become Vancouver's most livable city were starting to evolve. Now, I always start when I'm working elsewhere in the world to compliment the politicians. Bob, but most particularly Michael and the people, Mike, who were part of your group in the 1970s, who turned the city around. And what I say that is very significant is that the values that the Council of 1972 held around stopping the freeways, about public involvement, about complete communities, those values lasted for six mayors and 14 councils. And it was that continuity of values which I think shaped and resulted in Vancouver making the transformation it did. Now, moving to people, we were lucky to have farm teams during that time. Citizens who were so actively involved, Michael's just seen himself. <laughs> well, not your project. People who were so actively involved, whether it was through committees of council, whether it was through volunteering in community groups, the public sector, private sector, non-NGOs, non-profit sector, all of those people contributed significantly to Vancouver, but in many respects were the farm team for the councils that followed them. And those farm teams meant that people who got onto council had a pretty good idea of what was happening, how the city could evolve, and their values added to the council values, I think shaped Vancouver leading into the world's most livable city. Oh yes, well, there's the public sector and the private sector. There's Michael and Jim Moody and uh, Rick Holbert and Shirley uh, Smith, who was with the um, NGO group. Now, the third group is Ray. We didn't hold anything against him that Ray actually was a British planner, <laughs> or a British architect for that matter. Because one of the things about Ray was that he strongly believed in the value of putting together the social, economic, and cultural environment and looking at sustainability really before sustainability became a word. Now, Ray provided inspiration. He provided innovative ideas. He provided integrity for the planning department, he also hired a number of us. And if we look like we're deer in the headlights, well, we were. 
For most of us, it was our very first job in planning. And what Ray did as a management style was that he encouraged each of us to contribute in the way which could most use our skills. One little story. I remember the very first day I walked into Ray's office. He said, well, Ann, nice to see you. Glad you've joined the city. Uh, I have a meeting this morning. And he handed me a memo. There was no email at that time. He handed me a memorandum and said, there's a meeting about to happen in the uh, city uh, mayor's office. And that meeting is going to have the mayor, some councillors, including Mike, city manager, director of finance. They want to talk a bit about how we're going to use city land for nonprofit and co-op housing. You're representing the planning department, Anne. Uh, OK. <laughs> so I went and I sat at that table. And I looked around. And I had my me too moment. Not me too as described today, but me too. Hey, Ray was giving me the opportunity to be part of shaping the future of the city. So Ray gave all of us the opportunity, in my case a policy wonk, to do lots of studies. One of those studies, Mike, you might remember because you took that 1980 study to Ottawa and managed to get an extra unit allocation, which over 35 years resulted in about $900 million of extra federal money to co-op and nonprofit housing. I wish my pension was based on the money that we <laughs> earned, not the money I earned. So we each got to contribute in our own way. Ray left in 1988, but the values that he espoused followed up through the planners for the next 20 years, through the policies and programs we initiated, though I think Ray always thought that city plan was local area planning on steroids. In any event, the question is, what happened to all of those recruits of Ray's? Well, 45 years later, we still care profoundly about the city of Vancouver. Thank you. So the South Coast chapter is not just Vancouver, nor Burnaby, nor Richmond, nor Metro. It also includes Whistler. And um, to tell us a little bit about the story of Whistler, um, it's my pleasure to invite up a very old friend who, uh, who's not featured in this picture without his clothes, just with his clothes. Neil, they asked me, was I sure you'd be all right if I kept this photo on the screen while you started? I said, absolutely. <laughs> Neil was the, very involved in the South Shore Falls Creek. He became a partner in the firm Sutcliffe Griggs Moody. You just saw Moody, the Tom Selleck look-alike uh, in the earlier picture. But it was Neil's firm that was hired to do much of the initial planning for what is Whistler. Thanks very much again to the work of Bob Williams. So Neil, you have to speak into the microphone. You have to push the button that doesn't have the big arrow, which is why everyone is confused. Okay. And uh, manage to hold three things plus your glasses in two hands all at once. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I think we can move on from that picture pretty quickly. <laughs> but indeed, Whistler was a very, very active community for years before all the skiers discovered Whistler. And, and it was because of the free um, spirit that made up Whistler in the early years. And that really is one of the key features as to why the village got built so quickly. We worked, uh, Doug Sutcliffe, Jim and I, we worked with the city council, uh, well, no, sorry. We worked before there was a city council in Whistler. Whistler was uh, a part of a regional district. And when we first met with them, they said, this is where we want to go. 
And we said, well, what, 20 years from now? Or how do you want to make that happen? And the short answer was the provincial government said, we have done a lot of homework, Bob Williams and others uh, in those departments, and we believe in the, the opportunity that skiing could have a big economic impact to the province. And so it was that premise that they said, we, we would like to hire a company, which was myself, Doug Sutcliffe, and Jim Moody, who understood the development process and would be able to then quickly move it from a dream to reality. And it, in fact, in a five-year period, we were able to, with the help of the provincial government, get construction started from a dream. So when we started, the Rissola population was about 500 people and 87,000 skiers. After two, well, 2018 today, its resident population is 12,000 and 2.3 million skier visits and, and a total of three million visitors, which is really the summertime population that moves up to have a look at Whistler. So the first task was looking at where the town centre should be. Quick answer from the provincial key people, we have figured that out. We think it should be between at the base of the two biggest mountains which already had an international population. But there were some people uh, in Whistler that felt it should be on a lake because it's, that's how Whistler was first discovered as a fishing summertime uh, facility. Very quickly after a consultation between the province and Whistler, the Whistler municipality was formed and it would consist of elected representatives from Whistler and a provincial government represented on that, uh, on that board. And that, uh, that individual uh, was um, uh, Al Rain. And Al had traveled to maybe 30 ski resorts in his life as a manager of the men's downhill ski team. So here we are, a year, in, uh, a year into the project, uh, and this is the connection that had to be made from the village, in this case, up Blackcomb Mountain. Well, Blackcomb Mountain at the time said, you know, we've got, we got a road that'll take us in four or five minutes up to our bench lands. What do we need this link for? And they listened, they cooperated, and the provincial government cooperated, and provided them additional development opportunities on the mountain. At the other end of the mountain was the part of the village that we were advised the local community really needed local shopping, a local drugstore, a, a, a hardware store. There was, there was no retailing happening in Whistler early on in the, in the early days, they had to drive down to Squamish. So this was the part of the, I, you know, I think I missed an important picture here. Yes, <laughs> I needed that. Because there, were, there was no area like a pub in Whistler in those days other than in a hotel. So the very first facility that we built uh, in, the, in the village was a local pub. And it became uh, a meeting place. It became very, uh, a very popular uh, area. So we figured that it should be one of the first pieces that gets developed. So at the other end of the street, this is the connection onto the mountain. We were plagued with uh, being labeled by the unions as being a single project. Therefore, it had to be all union. Well, the reason they thought it was going to be a single project is we, we provided underground parking throughout this village area, and we needed a garage that connected one property to another. So after a week in hearings, they finally said, OK, just the Delta Hotel needs to be union, but the rest will um, uh, will classify as being, can be built by non-union people. The provincial leadership was 
absolutely fundamental to have Whistler happen and happen as quickly as it did. They, they created a community plan on the 50 acres at the base of the uh, mountains that they'd already secured for some future village. They uh, created the municipality of Whistler with the condition that uh, one of the councillors be an, a provincial appointee. They that helped us in Whistler in the very early days leverage funds, funds from the federal government for the sewer and the water system. The local community played an enormous part. If they felt that they could have a place that was a meeting place for themselves as well as uh, um, um, other services that weren't available, other retail services, they were on board very, very quickly. Because we wanted to have hotel accommodation in the village right in the beginning, and because we also wanted local shops to satisfy the residents, we had the second floor of the entire town center um, with a covenant on it that it had to be in a rental pool. The owners could use it, they'd have to reserve their space, but when not being used by themselves, it had to be in a rental pool. And that was the beginning of hotels and very attractive second story village centered places. Whoops, am I going too fast here? Yeah. It was the vision in government, in the provincial government, the NDP government at that time, who were betting on the fact that provide um, facilities for the local residents and you'll have them being your strongest supporters. And that's in fact how the Whistler Village developed so quickly. Very quickly, resident groups uh, formed and supported and undertook projects in the village. Have I gone too far? One. That's good. That's your last one. That's my last one. So to keep, uh, and I've, I'm run out of time, but to uh, to wrap up the story that if it wasn't for the provincial government's positive attitude and not wanting to develop it by their housing department or whatever else, they were prepared to let the local community take the lead so long as they had representation on the board, that made life for us as developers magic. We'd have a board meeting of the development company, ourselves presenting our wish list to our board. We ended that meeting, five minutes later we opened a meeting of the um, council and put the five requests to them. It required no debate because they'd already, already as a group debated it and it got passed and, and dealt with very, very quickly. So within a, within a three year period, we got from a, la a piece of 53 acres with nothing on it to a village that could in fact host a, an Olympic game. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Okay, it's the 70s and the 80s. But I think as we move to the future, you'll see so many lessons from the past. Uh, to pick up on Ray Spaxman's notion that you really have to plan for uncertainty. As I look around the room, I remember the time, Harold, when I came before Richmond Council trying to rezone some industrial land for, into residential, arguing that it was totally inappropriate for industrial land, and I got it approved. Five years later, the market changed. I went back to Richmond Council to rezone that residential land back into industrial land, arguing it really wasn't a suitable location for housing. Similarly, what we have seen in Vancouver, where the city used to bonus developers if they would agree, you could build some, if you would agree to build some housing, they would let you build some more office. And today we're almost prohibiting developers from building residential in some areas in order to protect the office. The only point is, we have to recognize that just because things were the way they were yesteryear doesn't mean it's going to be that way in the future. But I would like to just ask you to th join me in thanking all of my decade speakers for what I hope you found to be a worthwhile hour. Wonderful.
Thank you. Thank you to all of the speakers and to everyone for sitting and listening to all of these incredible stories that we've heard over the past uh, hour. Um, also to note, incredibly, we are perfectly on time. We didn't even have to play the Academy Award music once. So we'll have to see if that continues into the second half. Um, I did want to uh, say that we're going to pause here for a 15 minute intermission. Uh, there are uh, drink tickets that you can purchase to buy more drinks at the bar. Um, over the intermission, we will be honoring uh, community leaders of the past whose legacy continues to shape planning to this day uh, in the slides. So we encourage you to, to pause and, and um, watch that slideshow, as well as to share your own memories of other community leaders of the past who you'd like to share on our in memoriam board at the back, uh, or to share your own stories uh, around the room in the, on the storyboards. Yes, Shirley? I just want to apologize to some people in the room like Marguerite Ford for failing to end my story in explaining why 1973 the battle of the freeway was over. It was over because we elected an NDP government led by Dave Barrett and we elected a team council with Mayor um, Art Phillips and with uh, his brilliant second in command, which was Walter Hardwick. So I just want you to know that it took a change in government to turn things around. And thank you for that, giving me a moment just to say that. Thank you. All right, so please, uh, everyone, uh, enjoy connecting with your colleagues, grab a drink.